Praise the Lord. Before hearing the preaching of God's word today, let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this day which thou hast made. That we rejoice and be glad in it. On this, the first day of the week, the Lord's day. That we not forsake the assembly ourselves together as men of some is, but to exhort one another, and so much more as the day approaching. And as newborn babes we desire the sincere milk of thy word, whereby we may grow thereby, as man shall not live but alone, but every word which proceedeth out of thy mouth, sanctifies thy truth, for thy word is truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we hear the preaching of God's word, I'd like to testify that there's one thing that God cannot do. God cannot lie. The Lord always speaks the truth. In fact, the Lord is so truthful, he commands us that our yea must be yea, that our nay must be nay. Anything more than these cometh of evil. We know God is not evil. Therefore, the Lord speaks is truth. God will and shall never lie. This is one of the reasons why I fell so in love with my Heavenly Father back in 1995. I learned back in 1995 that God keeps his promises. I read in a gospel booklet the promise found in Mark chapter 11, verse 24, in which it is written, Therefore I say unto you, what things shall you desire, when ye pray, but lead that you receive them, and ye shall have them. Wow, there's a God that's given to us promises. And now he's given to us promises. He keeps his promises as well. He's a promise-keeping God. I fell in love with God, my heavenly Father. When I got born again and learned, he is a promise-keeping God. You see, I grew up as a product of divorce and remarriage. Divorce and remarriage is a sin in God's sight. In fact, divorce by itself is a sin that God hates. Many professing Christians like to rail on the Sodomites and like to rail on sodomy, which is an abomination, the Son of God. But divorce is a sin that God hates, the Word of God says. Now, as abominable as sodomy is, and it is an abomination, God never says he hates sodomy, though it's an abomination. But divorce is worse than the sin of sodomy. It is a sin that God hates. And why is that? I can testify why. Because the children are the ones that suffer when it comes to divorce and when it comes to divorce and remarriage. And how many lies I was told throughout my life. How many promises are given to me that were never kept how I grew up with so much hate, not trusting in anyone and any word spoken to me because I was lied to all my life. And those that come from divorce or remarriage, they can testify they experience the same thing. How many times your parents weren't there for you when other children's parents were because of a product of divorce and remarriage. But in 1995, when I learned of my heavenly father, he has promises that he keeps, and he never lies. That healed me from all the lies that were told to me and all the false prom broken promises that are given to them in my life. I was healed because I found someone even greater that I could trust in. God, my Heavenly Father, that I can love with all my heart, all my soul, my mind, and all of my strength. Because he has first loved me. Because he is love. And because God keeps his promises, and because God shall never lie, he has promised to us in Psalm 12, in the 12th Psalm. Once again, there is no chapters in Psalms. Each Psalm is a number by itself. So here somebody say Psalm chapter they don't know their Bibles. Psalm 12, verse 6 and verse 7, that is written. The words of the Lord are pure words, 
has silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. God has promised to preserve his pure words for us forever. God who cannot lie. God who has promises and keeps his promises, has promised his pure words shall be with us forever. And it is written in the book of 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Sorry about that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. For this cause also think we God without ceasing, because you receive the word of God which you of us. He received not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. God's word, his pure words is preserved for us, will only effectually work in us if what? If we believe it. Jesus Christ says in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, it is written. But he, the Lord Jesus Christ, answered and said, It is written, Man shall live by alone, but by every word that what proceedeth out of the mouth of God. To live day by day, we need the word of God. The word of God, which every word proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That means every word is God breathed. Every word is inspired. If we do not have the words that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, the inspired word of God, you cannot live. <clears throat> How many professing Christians we know? Even the man who gave me the gospel booklet in which I was born again recently preached on his YouTube channel. He recently professed that only the originals were inspired and the originals don't exist. And he professed all we have is translations today and even confessed every translation is different. No wonder that man is thrice married in the ministry, divorced or remarried. No wonder he's a con man and a deceiver, a false prophet. Years ago he claimed that Obama was the rider of the white horse in Revelation. Now he's saying it's somebody else. He changes it to what the newspaper says. No wonder he's such a false prophet because he doesn't believe the Bible in his hand proceeded out of the mouth of God is inspired by God. Because back 20 years ago, when Christians all had Bibles and would go to churches with Bibles in their hands and would open their Bibles and search the scriptures, those famous false teachers back then told them their Bibles were not inspired. Told them you couldn't trust in your Bible. I remember back in 1999, my wife and I returned back to Honolulu, Hawaii. And one of my friends, who the Lord used for us to be a blessing to, he'd become an assistant pastor of a large church in Honolulu, Hawaii. And at that time in 1999, they divided this famous guest preacher and because this famous guest preacher was of Jewish descent, all the churches were exalting him and went to this meeting back in 1999. And that guest preacher, the big name and a big ministry, he told all the congregation to take their Bibles and put it under their seats. He commanded them and would not proceed in his service. Back in the days in 1909, when Christians came to church with their Bibles and would search the scriptures and highlight scriptures and take notes and see whatever the preacher says in line with the word of God or not, that false prophet, that false teacher did not want that to be done to him back in those days and told the church to put their Bibles under their seats. That was 1999. He was falsely prophesying that in the few months in the year 2000, there be a thing called Y2K. He falsely prophesied that would start the tribulation. He had written special books that if he had money and would put the money in the air, that would give you those books. When he had money, I didn't get those books. Praise God for that. 
because Y2K was a lie. That man was a liar. It was false. He prophesied claimed that he had led a billion souls to the Lord, had a whole TV thing about to watch, and then in 1999, he was going to do a crusade, and Israel has a final crusade, as they believe the tribulation was going to start in the year 2000, based on Y2K. As hindsight's 2020, you see what a false prophet he was. What a false prophet he still is, yet people still believe in him. People still listen to false prophets like that, that tell you to put your Bible under the seat. You don't have to do it the day. People don't come to church of Bibles today. That's why there's a lack of faith today. That's why there's so many deceived today. That's why there's so many deceivers out there today. Because they no longer believe they have God's Word. This book in our hands, the authorized version of the Holy Bible, is a fulfillment of God's promise in which He would preserve His pure words for us forever. And Jesus Christ says, that man shall not live by the bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. This is the fulfillment of Christ's command that we must live by the words which proceed out of the mouth of God. We have it here in our hands. God breathed, God inspired, and it will effectually work only in you that believe. If somebody listens to my preaching and does not believe in the Bible, does not believe the authorized version of the Holy Bible is the Word of God, they're wasting their time. It won't work for them. It will do them no good. You've got to believe that this right here, this book in our hands, every word in it proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Every pure word here in this Bible is preserved by the Lord. Proceedeth out of His mouth. And when you believe that, it shall work effectually in you that believe. Once again, the book of James, chapter 5, it is written. <coughs> in the book of James, chapter 5. Verse 14, once again. Is any sick among you? Question. What's the answer? Let him call for the elders of the church. What does it not say to do? It does not say to claim your healing. Why must we say that? Because there's false teachers out there today that believe you have to claim your healing. That's what they call the name and the claim. That you've got to claim your healing. They believe they've got to confess it over and over again. That healing is something they must claim from God. The Bible does not say to do so. Is any sick among you that I'm called for the elders of the church? Notice it does not say to resist that sickness. You see, there's false teachers out there and people that are seen by those false teachers that think you've got to resist the sickness when it comes on you, that you must resist it. Where does that teaching come from? It comes from a Gnostic heresy, from the false versions out there of the Bible, that where they believe they are little, little gods. In Psalm 8 it is written that God has made man a little lower than the angels. Yet in corruptions of God's word they have mistrends of the Hebrew word Elohim which can mean God at times, which can even mean judges, which can even mean angels. And they mistranslate that word and say God has created man a little lower than God. Then they believe that they are little gods. And that when they got born again, they believed they are spirits, not souls. And their spirit became God's spirit. They became little gods. And because they believe that they're spirits, and their spirit has become God's spirit, and they're little gods, they believe they must resist sickness and disease. And when you study church, early church writings, you see that fit some of the Gnostic heresies. That's what the Gnostics believe in. And what did Jesus Christ say he, he felt about the doctrine of the Gnostics? Said to the Nicolaitans, he said he hates their doctrines. What about their deeds? Jesus Christ said he hates their deeds. And these doctrines of little gods and resisting sickness and these deeds of resisting sickness are things that Jesus hates. Praise God for his word. Praise God. We see, what do we do when we're sick? 
He don't claim your healing. He don't resist your sickness and disease. When you're sick, let him call for the elders of the church. Once again, this shows us no Christian is an island to himself. Christians need one another. To get to heaven, Jesus Christ says you must do what? What you have done to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. You've got to treat Christians a special way. You've got to treat others in a special way. You just can't go off on your own. You just can't get to a place where you're by yourself. No Christian is an island to himself. In fact, the Bible is all about serving one another. When you meet people say, I'm following Jesus. I don't follow any church. Well, that's not following Jesus. Because Jesus teaches us about gathering in his name, about serving one another, about washing one another's feet, about doing things to others, especially his brethren. And when you're sick, what does the Bible say? Let him call for the elders of the church. Are you in that place where you've got elders that you can call upon? If not, that's a telltale sign. You're out of the will of God. You're in the wrong place. How many professing Christians have got outside the will of God because of sin? It's led them astray. And they get to a place where there's no elders to call upon. And what are they going to do when they're sick? They can obey God's word. And if they don't obey God's word, the Bible calls it witchcraft. Because disobedience is the sin as witchcraft. You've got to do it God's way. And what does God's way say to do when we're sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. And let them pray over him. Now when you're sick, you need others praying over you. The Bible says do not pray over yourself. Years ago, a famous healing evangelist, which is not in the Bible, came and did a healing crusade and Back then, we didn't have the internet, so they'd go in person to test the spirits. And because it with all the churches in Thailand got behind it, I went there to the healing campaign to see it in person. And this so-called healing evangelist, he didn't heal anybody. He commanded the people to heal themselves, to lay hands on themselves, and then if they got healed, to come up on the stage. And what happened? A blind person in the walk and a... A blind person had to walk, and then the, the blind could walk, and the lame could see. That's all that happened. Nobody got healed. In fact, one man came up there, was dying on the last stage of cancer, and the so-called healing evangelist said, Why do you bring people like this up? And rebuked the ushers on the stage to block off from sick people coming on the stage, and said, We need to call an ambulance to get this guy to the hospital. That man was not a healer. He was a con man. He was a deceiver coming in the name of the Lord, telling people to heal themselves. And then if you get healed, blame yourself for it. You didn't have enough faith. The Bible says not to pray of yourself when you're sick. No, when you're sick, you must let them call for the other church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. What does this show us? The false teaching of healing in the atonement is not found in the word of God. In Acts chapter 4, the apostles prayed for God to stretch forth his hand to heal. And that signs want to be done by the name of the Holy Child, Jesus. Notice the apostle didn't pray. The people can have a revelation of healing the atonement and claim their healing. That God would stretch forth his hand and heal the sick. In Acts chapter 3, when the lame man was healed, the apostle Peter said, why look ye on us? And then said it was through faith and the name of Jesus is why that man was healed. He didn't preach healing in the atonement. He didn't do a healing crusade and say, you can claim your healing too. He didn't do such a thing. When Epaphroditus was sick in Philippians chapter 2, and the apostle Paul prayed for him, what did the apostle Paul say was the reason God answered the prayers? Because he had mercy on them. He didn't say, say, claim healing the atonement. 
He didn't say because of the stripes of Jesus, that's where we receive physical healing. He didn't say such a thing with that. He said because God had mercy on him. And when Timothy had afflictions, would the apostle Paul tell him, claim your healing? No. Drink, no longer drink only water, drink a little wine for thy often infirmities. Once again, we see in the Bible in practice, they didn't believe healing was in the atonement. They didn't believe you claimed the healing. In Mark 16, verse 20 is written, And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. Who did the signs? The Lord, not healing in the atonement. And here in James 5, we see it's the Lord that shall raise him up. Jesus Christ the same, yesterday, today, and forever. It's the Lord that heals. It's the Lord that we look to. It's the Lord whom we put our faith in. And it's the Lord that answers our prayers and heals us physically. And if he have given his sins, they shall be forgiven him. Verse 16, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another. Once again, no Christian's island to himself. You've got to be amongst brethren that you can confess your faults to and pray for each other. If you get to a place where you rely on prayers from people in other places, you're out of the will of God. You're in the right place. You've got to be in the place where you can have people to pray for you right there on the spot. That's Christianity. The effect of her forever righteous men avail of much. Verse 17. Elias, or Elia, or Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are. Verse 17, Elijah, Elias, Elias, Eliyahu in Hebrew, he was a man. Everybody here in the Bible was a man just like us. I, when I was a Thai boxer, once again, I've testified about, I was trained in a gym with over 30 boxers. Tight, small gym. Everybody's competing, even in the gym, competing with each other. It was much like in that movie, Spartacus. Remember the movie Spartacus, and Spartacus at the gladiator camp in the movie, he wanted to befriend an African guy. And the African guy said, Shh, I may have to kill you one day. Well, that's the one in this gym, because people get sold to other gyms often. You may have to fight each other one day. Everybody's an enemy, all in competition with each other. Well, I learned back in those days that the winners were the people you need to spend time with. I don't fellowship with losers. Losing is contagious. We only fellowship with overcoming Christians, overcomers. We don't fellowship with losers or quitters or the double-minded. We don't fellowship such as that. We don't fellowship with the overcomers, the winners. So I learned back there as a tie boxer, if you want to be a winner, you've got to fellowship with the winners. And what else I learn? When you're around winners and you see them winning, hey, if he can do it, I can do it. So I'm doing the same things he's doing. One of my friends back at the Sasebapa gym, if you could call him that, again, we're all in competition. We weren't really friends. But he was a Thai boxer I looked up to and a Thai boxer I was kind of close to. His name was Sulin, named after the province of Sulin. And back in 1994, the flu went around. And in this tight gym of 30 boxers, we all caught the flu. I caught it, I had to miss a fight because of it, and then it spread to other boxers. Well, the gym owner didn't like this and blamed us for getting sick. And Sulin caught the flu as well. It was spreading. That's what viruses do. And they didn't appreciate us getting sick in tight quarters with the virus spreading, barefooted, sweating everywhere. Everybody's going to get sick. Whatever one boxer had, the other is going to get. And Sulin, he had to miss a fight as well. They were very upset with him, with me. They forgave me because they had other fights lined up for me. But for Sulin, they wanted to punish him. And they punished him by setting him up with a knockout artist who was on a winning streak by knockouts. Nobody could defeat this Thai boxer from the Fane Detlock camp. And the Detlock camp was known for body punches and leg kicks. And this boxer from the Detlock camp, he was winning his fights by knockouts on a knockout street and they just set Sulin up to get knocked out. When all the other boxers had finished their training for the day, I looked at the gym and only one boxer was left there, overtraining, 
Sulin. And he was training leg kicks. And after the round was over, he jumped up while he was holding the heavy bags and began doing pull-ups. And with three rounds, I said, he's going to win. Everybody else thought he was going to be set up to lose. I knew he was going to win. And then I went to that fight. And not only did he win, he won by knockout because he leg kicked a fighter from the deadlock camp and busted it. I don't know if he broke his leg or not, but busted his leg. You could hear the kick, the sound of it, echo throughout the whole stadium. And they had to carry that box out screaming on the stretcher. I knew this was going to happen. And that encouraged me. If he can do it, I can do it. And how did he do it? He overtrained. He went the extra mile. He put in the extra work. And if he could do it and win such an impossible match like that, I can do it and win impossible matches. That's what happens when you fellowship with overcomers. You find out if they can do it, you can do it. Praise God, we're in fellowship before with Christians who can raise the dead. And I've been with them as they raise the dead. And learn if they can do it, I can do it as well. Praise God, we fellowship with the saints. Praise God, we fellowship with the overcomers. Praise God, we fellowship with those who can do the impossible. Because when you follow such like that, you can do the impossible. And Elias, he was a man just like us, subject to like passions as we are. Yet he's known for getting answers to prayer. He's known for doing the impossible. Even he was a man subject to like passions as we are. The Bible says, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained on the earth by the space of three years and six months. He was a man subject to like passions as we are. Yet he could pray earnestly that it might not rain, and we see it rained on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Because he was a man just like us. How did Elijah do it? First Kings chapter 17. We will see how. First Kings chapter 17. Verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite, Eliyahu HaTishbi, and Elijah the Tishbite, who was in the inhabitants of Gilead, Eliyahu Giladi. There's a song they sing at Passover about Eliyahu Hanavi, Eliyahu HaTishbi, Eliyahu Giladi, Eliyahu Hanavi. There's a song the Jews sing at Passover. Eliyahu the Tishbite, who was in the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Verse 2. And the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get thee and send, turn the eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Kirith, that is by Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So Elijah had the word of the Lord. And by the word of the Lord, the Lord had showed him that it would not rain for three years and six months if he did what? If he prayed. He could boldly say, As the Lord of Israel liveth, for my sand there shall not be do nor in three years, but according to my word. How could he say so? Because the Bible says he prayed earnestly. He was a man of like passions like us. He was just a man, flesh and blood like us. Losers say, well, flesh, and then the flesh will do good things. And they just give up and sin and do not fulfill God's will. Elijah was a man just like us, flesh and blood like us. But he didn't give in to his flesh. He didn't give in to his doubts and unbelief. No, he served the Lord. He followed the Lord. He believed the Lord. And not only did he pray in James chapter 5, it is written, he prayed earnestly 
that it might not rain for the space of three years and six months. And it did not rain. He didn't claim it. He prayed earnestly. Once again, we have the Word of God with many promises by God who cannot lie. But God's Word only works if we believe it. And what else must we do with it? Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55. Oh, that's 40. Sorry about that. The X and the V is a 40. Got to go here with the L by itself. Once again, I want to get my Roman numbers down one of these days. Isaiah chapter 55, chapter LV. <laughs> it is written... Verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Praise God, God's ways are higher than our ways. We do things God's way, we do things higher than man's ways. God's ways always works. Praise the Lord. Verse 9, verse 9, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are your thoughts. Verse 10, for as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be, that it goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to be void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. What is God speaking about here scientifically? Rain, and a return back to heaven. What we call that? Evaporation. Praise God, just last week, as we're at Batum Tani, had a rainstorm, and you got to see all the steam rising from the sidewalks and from the roads, and why it was so steamy and so hot after the rain. And you get to see that, because that's evaporation. Rain comes down, rain goes back up. That's evaporation. That's what rain and even snow does. But that's what rain, we live in a tropical country where there is no snow, but that's what rain does. It comes down and it goes back up. It evaporates. When it comes down, what's it do first before it goes back up? It waters the ground. As is written, Isaiah 55, verse 10, For as the rain come down the so heaven, and with that thither, but water the earth, and make it bring forth them by them, make it seed the storm, bread it either, so shall my word be that go forth of my mouth, it shall not return to be void, but shall accomplish the place, and it shall prosper the thing where it's always in it. The rain comes down, waters the earth. Waters the earth, it can bring forth the seed, it can bring forth, how does it say? But it shall bring forth and bud. There will be a seed of the storm bread to the eater. That's what rain does, and praise God for rain, and how important rain is. And here we are in the rainy season, which is a very important season this part of the world without the rainy season there is no harvest there is no rice the rain comes down waters the earth that it may bring forth and bud and give seed the sowing bread to the eater and that's how god relates his word to so shall my word be given forth in my mouth it shall not return unto me void but it shall accomplish the place of prosper the thing where to i where to i send it so i've gone out with christians before They've given out gospel literature. People have taken it, ripped it up, and thrown it away. And Christians said, no problem. God's word should not turn to void. That's not how it works. I've seen preachers preach before. Nobody listens. Well, God's word should not turn back to void. That's not how it works. In order for God's word to not return back to void, what must happen? It first must go out, just like rain. It must enter into people's ears, go into their heart, and now how does it return back to the Lord? They then pray to the Lord. That's how God's word works. It's not magic. 
won't just go out there preaching and preaching and preaching as some people do and think, well, that's going to do something. No. People have got to hear it. Not only must they hear it, they've got to receive it and believe it. And how does it go back to the Lord? Then they must pray it back to the Lord. They hear the gospel that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. They hear it, they receive it, they believe it, and then they must do what? Then they must call upon the name of the Lord, that if thou shalt confess the mouth of the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe the heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now, if they confess the Lord without first believing, nothing is going to happen. And how many false converts out there have answered an altar call, prayed a sinner's prayer, and there was no change in their lives. They never got saved to begin with. They never got born again because it must come from the Word first. Hear the Word. When you hear the Word, receive it. You receive it, then send it back to the Lord. Elijah heard from the Word of the Lord that it would not rain for three years and six months, except according to his word. So he confronted the king, Ahab, a wicked king, and told him that it would not rain. Thus saith the Lord, as the Lord God liveth, it shall not rain for the space of three years and six months. But Elijah didn't stop there. He earnestly prayed what the Lord had said shall come to pass. That's how God's word works. We receive God's word as it is in truth, the very word of God, not the word of man. We receive it as in truth. When we receive it, we believe it. We receive it through hearing it. We receive it and believe it. And then we pray according to his word, according to his will, earnestly. And as we do so, what is written shall come to pass, and God's word shall not return back to him void. It's not magic. That's how God's word works. Like the rain coming down from heaven, which we understand very clearly. That's what God's word does, like the rain coming down from heaven. And it shall not return back to him void, just like the rain returns back to heaven. It was God's word must return back to him by our praying. And once again, how did Elijah or Elias pray? James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Verse 17. Elias, the man subject to light, as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained on the earth by space of three years and six months. He prayed earnestly according to God's word. How many professing Christians, they give up. They pray one time, they pray two times or three times, something happens, they give up, they quit. What do we call quitters? Losers. Losers are winners who quit. Winners are losers who never quit. If you never quit, you'll always win. That's how it works. Winners are losers who never quit. And losers could have been winners, but what they do, they quit, they give up. And how many Christians give up on their praying? How many Christians seek God's word, take God at his word, pray on his word, and they give up, they doubt, they look, they go by faith, they go by sight, not by faith. Like Peter, they just start looking around them. Nothing's happening. In fact, it's getting worse, and they completely just give up. They stopped praying. It didn't work. And they meet them all the time. And their testimony is, God didn't answer their prayers. God didn't do it. God's word doesn't work. And they give up on the Lord. Because they're quitters. They're losers. Elijah, he prayed earnestly. He would not give up. He would not quit. He prayed according to God's word. And he prayed earnestly that thy will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. And it was God's will for it not to reign by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed it earnestly, and it did not reign for three years and six months. 
everything from God's Word, every one of His promises are the same. You've got to pray earnestly. God is not a mommy. God is a Father, a Heavenly Father. And He wants to, for us to grow. He wants for us to get better. He wants for us to go from glory to glory. Therefore, we go from faith to faith. Yesterday's faith won't make it. Today's problems take today's faith, a newer faith, a stronger faith. And tomorrow's faith, what we need for tomorrow, today's faith will not make it. We've got to grow stronger. We've got to grow from glory to glory, from faith to faith. We've got to pray earnestly. Never give up. Never back down. Take God at his word that his will shall be done on this earth as it is in heaven. And this is why we pray according to God's will as it is written, 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. And this is the confidence, not pride. We have confidence. And this is the confidence that we have in him, the Lord. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he heareth us whatsoever he asks, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Because we pray according to his will, we pray earnestly. We don't give up. We don't let God's word loose. We pray his will shall be done. Never giving up. Never quitting. Never being double-minded. Never wavering. Stay in the faith. In God's will. In God's word. And it shall be done on this earth as it is in heaven. If it worked for Elijah, it will work for us. He was a man just like we are. He was subject like passions as we are. But God's word worked for him. And God's word will work for us the same if we do what Elijah did. And he prayed earnestly. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy word, which endureth forever. The word is by thy gospel is preached unto us. Bring this even sanctifies thy truth, for thy word is truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord.